can you just talk a little bit about yourself and uh, how you, um, I mean, first, where, where, how do you get involved in this? I, I can see from your books that there's a lot of there's a lot of druid druid books mm. there. Mm. Um, would you call yourself a druid? Um, yes, I mean I don't like to use labels that limit and confine. Mm. But basically, when I when I was young, I met the old chief druid in London and, and trained with him and followed him and so on. And now I help to lead a, a, a druid group. And druidry is is having a huge revival because it's a sort of a green religion, I suppose, or it's a sort of a spiritual way that people who love nature uh, and love creativity, because there's the whole tradition of bardism within druidism, mm -hmm. which is you know, mm -hmm. creative spirit so it's tr it's undergone a huge revival in the last 10 15 years it's absolutely massive where, where, how is that kind of manifested where do you well, see it where, where can you see it well on the internet i suppose really, <laughs> the easiest really. way just you're you just google yeah. it and, and yeah. you're there you know um and but you know so we have for instance we have four camps a year we've been doing camps for about 15 years and and you know and when when one of our groups suggested that we do camps in the winter i said you know, you're crazy nobody will do that but we've been doing them for the last 15 years and adults and kids and teenagers come and it's like this return to the simple life where there's just the simplicity of an open fire <coughs> <coughs> and um, you know the simplicity of an open fire and of, um, of, of, of living simply on the land sure, sure. without televisions, without electricity. What, what well. kind of people, my, my, um, my only kind of recollection of Druid, Druidism is that kind of when I was sixteen or seventeen at four o'clock in the morning at Stonehenge, mm. um, which was you know pretty amazing. Mm. But at the, I remember, but you know, the people who were druids were hippies, basically. Mm. Yeah. You know, is that still the case? Is yes, it very? Yes. Yeah. You see, I think that, yes and no. I mean, I think that it's now broadened to include all sorts of people, all sorts of ages, all sorts of backgrounds, and so on. I think that the hippie connection is really, really interesting because you, you look now at the hippies mm -hmm. and certainly when I look at the hippie movement you think, oh my God, they were right. Uh, they were into, you know, organic farming, uh, you know, um, they didn't understand the dangers of smoking uh, things, uh, but they were into organic farming and uh, they, um, you remember, what is it, the Neil Young song, Look at Mother Nature on the Run, in the 1970s, yeah. nearly 40 yeah. years ago. So they, they knew it, and so you think, well, how come, how come they understood this? And you trace the roots of the hippie movement back, and you see they go into the roots of the whole Lebensreform movement in Germany, the Natur mention, mm -hmm. the, the, this whole movement that started back in the 19th century of trying to live in a new way that was more healthy, was more natural, yeah. was more simple. So for instance, the Druid group that I work with um, in the early part of the 20th century, the, 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 the Druid leader then, he came up with this concept of simplicitarianism. It's a sort of clumsy <laughs> word, <laughs> but you know, simplicitarianism <laughs> was living simply, living close yeah. to nature. Yeah. Uh, he was into health food and you know, nature cure and all the rest of it. So, so what, what's happened really, what I see as happening is these ideas of, of back to nature, if you like, uh, which can be traced as well across to America with the whole New England transcendentalists with people like Thoreau and Emerson and all the rest mm -hmm. of it who were talking about this. Um, and it's combined up with elements of getting close to nature, living simply. You know, Thoreau had this wonderful saying about, you know, the person who's happy is the one who's, whose bank account is light. You know, there isn't too, too much weight in the bank account, and that we you know, that all, <laughs> we should all be feeling very. Happy <laughs> yes, that's right. Really. You know, so so this idea of of simplicity and living lightly on the earth yeah. has actually been around for a long time, and the hippies got it. Interesting, isn't it? So you so the thirties, yeah, um, for you is a kind of seminal seminal point for when people really began to reevaluate um, what kind of system and lifestyle, and I, mean, lifestyle I think yeah really looking actually you have to go back slightly further to say so sort of the, the, the 1890s onwards sort of last end of the 19th century moving right the way through to the second world people war people sort of shuddering against shuddering against industrialization, industrialization and, and, sort of and then thing, militarism yeah. and then yeah. war you know and all the rest of it so they were dealing with all of that yeah. and so there were all these very exciting and interesting movements um, you know the hippie movement was born then for instance and so a lot of Jewish people particularly, but also just Germans, moved from um, 
from from Germany uh, with the rise to power of the Nazis and, and, and before even in the early 20th century and they moved to California and they became the first hippies and I mean hippie was a term used first in the 1930s what, what? and they you, you know you know the song Nature Boy that, uh -huh. that Nat King Cole uh -huh. made uh, famous um, that was by one of these natur mensch who came over and they had long hair and beards and they ate fruit and 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 were mostly in the nude and were into sort of yoga and exercise and fresh air and all that stuff so all all those ideas and and, and alternative ways of dealing with money not trying try not to buy into the capitalist system and so well, it would be interesting because one, one of the things that i um i um, i was writing about fairly recently, which is actually what kind of put me on to alternative currencies, was that there's an economist from the 1930s, a very, very famous American economist yeah. called Irving Fisher. Right. Um, and uh, he was, a, he was the, the sort of the American equivalent of Keynes. So oh, right. he was as prominent in America as Keynes was, basically, yeah. you know, at that time. And he, um, at the time of the Depression, came up with, um, or, or, or really, um, Supported the idea of alternative currencies, especially cu these currencies that actually like depreciate the longer that you hold them. So you've just you've got to keep moving around. You've got to keep them moving, else you lose money, right? Yeah. Um, and um, and the um, and and so he then wrote a whole book on alternative currencies, and he looked at, um, at he went to Bavaria and he found this kind of this coal mine, this coal mining town that had been completely sort of resuscitated by an alternative currency because it was the time of the of, um, of in the in the Weimar Republic when yeah. the money was worthless and you know yeah. there was hyperinflation and that sort of thing so uh, it's kind of you know it's a very it could be a moment a bit like now couldn't it well, where you know people are beginning to reevaluate once again I, you, know? you know I think what what happened in the problem with Nazism was that it was so horrendous and it was so ghastly that quite naturally people just turned away from that whole Epoch and the ideas associated because it didn't want so you get sort of people equate you know because Hitler was a vegetarian well I don't want to be a vegetarian <laughs> Christ you know and and you know so 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 n n n n you know the whole trick is not to throw the baby out with the bathwater right, you know of course right. and 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 so perhaps now people I think that was such an interesting era and and if one can see it it's almost like a, a process of redemption. You know, it's a bit like, you know, I don't know what the parallel would be, something like sort of AIDS and sex. You know, when sort of AIDS comes on, it's all so terrible. Well, I'm just never going to have sex so again with anything. It's just uh -huh. too awful, you know. But then you sort of come around to sort of some accommodation with the, your, your understanding. So, so I, think, I think that's really interesting. I mean, it'd be fascinating, wouldn't it, to look at Douglas's work, the social credit movement. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. Um, and to look at, um, uh, you know, the work of Fisher, was it? That yeah, Irving Fisher. Yeah, Irving yeah, Fisher yeah, and so on. Yeah. 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 Well, certainly. I mean, the other. Th I mean, the other thing is, is that you know, in a in a way, the the. I mean, from a very much a macroeconomic point of view, yeah. the views of Keynes, which again came out of that time, right? Yeah. You know, Keynes' the general theory was in 1936 uh -huh. that it was written, and since that time, Keynesian. I mean, in the sense, I guess, straight after that time, Keynesianism. Um, Endured as a, as the most popular economic kind of I ideology for thirty or forty years afterwards, right. and then has been in the abeyance and since it, it, the 1970s. It's gone down and down and down until suddenly everyone is reaching. You know, as, as you know, we're all game, Keynesians now once again. You know, spend, spend, spend that sort of thing. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, sorry.